old song, the blood will never lose its power.
name, Jesus. We've come to lift up your name. We've got so many reasons to praise the Lord for his blood, for his resurrection. Hallelujah. thankful for each and every one of you that have chosen to spend Easter at the anchor. We don't take that lightly, but haven't we felt the touch of God already today in this building? Amen. My, my text will come from John 14 and 1 today. John 14 and 1. You can just remain seated. You've been standing for a long time and I understand that. I um, Jesus said, if you believe in God, he said, believe also in me. He said, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I, I'd have told you so. But he said, I go to prepare. Bible says that the Lord stooped down himself. Everything else he had created with his own word. For in John 1 says in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. He spoke the universe, the earth into existence because he is our creator, our father. But I would say to you that when, when the earth was formed and everything is settled, he stooped himself down to the ground. He rolled his sleeves up. And Genesis 2 and 7 says that God formed man from the dust of the ground. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. It wasn't like anything else he had created for he said in Genesis 1 and 26, he said, let us make man in our image. In the male and female, he created in his own image. God made man. When he made man, he named him Adam. And he took Adam and he placed him in the paradise of paradise. There was no place like it. Yes, the earth was perfect itself, but he was in the garden in a paradise among paradise. Surrounded by, by rivers and a place that there was no pain, there was no headache. There never been the feeling of guilt, shame, remorse. They never had grief that was there because there had never been a loss. There had never been a death. There were no doctors there because there was no need of a physician because no one had ever been sick. This place was perfect in all of its ways. He looked at Adam, his son, who the Bible calls the son of God. He looks at him because he was created by God. And he said, Adam... I've made this for you, but there's just one thing I do not want you to do. Don't eat of the tree. It is sin, and when you do, it has good in it, but it has evil in it as well. The day that you eat of that tree, you're going to die. It's some time after this period that God makes Adam to go to sleep, and he, he puts him to sleep and pulls a rib out of his side, and he, he makes the first female, and and uh, brings her to him in the garden, this place that had been prepared for them, the first family, the first home in this garden. When he wakes up, he calls a woman, later names her even Eve. And he looks at Eve and he says, Eve, all of this belongs to us. Look at the place that God has made. As a matter of fact, you'll find the same voice that formed them was the same voice that would come in the cool of the day and walk with them. And he said, God had told me, 
don't touch of that tree or don't eat of that tree. He said, why don't we do this? Let's not touch it either. Eve, don't get near the tree. We want to stay in this place of paradise, this place of no pain, no sickness, no sorrow, no regret. You'll find that, that somehow in, 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 in the process of time, you'll find that a serpent slithered into their world and began to have conversations with her. The seducer, that old Bible says, the, that old devil, old Satan, the serpent, began to have conversations with her. I would say it's nothing less than the tempter, temptation. He begins to have conversations with Eve and somehow her mind began to change. What was forbidden is now interesting and appealing. Because it got in her mind, the Bible says, when lust is conceived, it brings forth sin. When sin is finished, it brings forth death. And something uh, that, that, that in her eyes, her, her mind began to change because what she was looking at and listening to. Her heart began to change and it wasn't long because her mind changed. That she made a decision to take her feet and oppose the word of the Lord. With her feet led her to the tree. With her hands she reached for the tree. And she plucked the tree with her hands. And then with her mouth she took a bite of the fruit that was forbidden. And when she did she took the same fruit and handed it to her, her husband Adam. And he also took of the tree. And when they both took of the tree. The Bible says that their eyes were open. They begin to think differently than they used to think. From that very moment, that very moment, the body became corruptible. That body that could have lived forever began, began to die from that moment forward. Their minds weren't the same in this sin that they had committed. The Bible says that God, the voice of the Lord, and the walking in the cool of the, cool of the day came and pushed them out of the garden. He said, because you've done this. He said, a curse is going to come upon you. You're going to have to earn what you get with the sweat of the brow, with the bruising of your hands and the bruising of your body. Listen to me. He said, there's going to come a curse. There's going to be thorns and thistles. And, and somewhere I'll have to throw in there poison ivy. I think that had to be something that came in that. I still got it on me from cutting some trees the other day. But there were things that came from that curse that came into the land that were not there before. And you look and the Bible says that man's sin has separated him from God. Man sins. They begin to look in other areas. It's not long until murder has creeped into the heart of their son that kills their son Abel. And it's not what God intended for it to be. But I'll stop here today and tell you God never intended for it to stay that way. Amen. He had a plan that there would be a redeemer. From that moment forward there was hope that there's a savior that is on the way. That's going to save us from the thing that got us out of his presence. He's going to be able to get us back into his presence. Isaiah recorded this prophet hundreds of years before Jesus was born. He said, unto us a child is born and a son is given. Oh, his name shall be called Wonderful. We'll be called Counselor. We're going to call him the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. And he's going to be the Prince of Peace. There's one on the way. He even said in chapter 7 that he would be born through a virgin womb. And we understand, especially through the Christmas story, that there was a Savior. When the angel came to Virgin Mary and said unto her that you're going to conceive, you're going to bring for the Son, you're going to call his name Jesus. And guess what he's going to do? He's going to save his people from their sin. He was born. He appears at 12 years old in the temple. Disappears until about age 30. But when he walks on the scene in his ministry... What's the nature of this Savior? He walks up to a woman that is thirsty, that had had five husbands, that, and the one she now has doesn't belong to her. He walks up to her and he says to this woman that have multiple broken relationships, and he said, if you drink of this water, you're going to thirst again. But I've got something I want to give you, you'll never thirst again. Watch what he does. He said, I would like to make an exchange with you. Give me your pot, I'll give you the well. Give me what's trying to satisfy the emptiness of your soul. And I'm going to give you something that will satisfy you forever. Can I tell you today, he understood what she needed was not another drink out of the pot. She needed the drink from him. For he said, I am that living water. He understood what's missing in your life is not another million. It's, it's not another antidote. It's me. You have been separated from me. If you'll give me the pot, I will give you me. 
We see an interest in a man that had been lame his entire life for 38 years. He'd been placed beside the pool of Bethesda. The reason it was there is because the blood that was in the sacrifice of the lamb would flow down and flow. And one day a year, whoever got in the water first got healed. Doesn't sound fair, does it? One miracle a year. And Jesus walks down to a man that has, he's crippled in his leg, he's lame, he cannot walk. And it's simply this, he, he comes out and he says, will you be made whole? And he looks, he said, I don't have a man, I don't have anybody to carry me to the water. And, and uh, I don't have anybody to take me there. If I just had somebody to help me, he said, he said, will you be made whole? He was looking for somebody to help him, but what he didn't realize, the help was standing right near him. The same one that was standing with Adam and Eve in the garden is standing right beside him right now. The one that formed man from the dust of the ground is standing right beside him right now. He didn't realize who was three feet away from him. And he simply said this, take up thy bed and walk. What he was saying, give me your bed, I'll give you your strength. Give me your bed. Give me what you've been laying on. Give me what you've been living in, and I'm going to give you what you've been desiring to have. There's an exchange for the feet. Can I say today that the hand of a withered man had been withered, I don't know how long, it appears as somewhere in his life. I think if he was not born withered because you can't have something withered unless it's withered. It has dried up. A man that had a good hand at one point in his life now was withered and drawn. Jesus walks up to this man and he makes an exchange with him. Are you ready? He said, stretch forth thine hand. Give me your handicap and I will make it whole. If you will give me what has crippled you, I am going to make you whole. And this man with a, with a withered hand, when he stretched it toward the Savior, it became whole as the other. I saw a miracle exactly like that standing right there. A man had a withered hand drawn like that. When I said, in the name of Jesus, be healed. Right before my eyes, his hand was made whole. Because Jesus is a healer. Jesus is a healer. He walks up to a woman. He walks up to a woman that, that, that was caught in the very act of adultery. Matter of fact, she was taken to him. She was accused. Her condemners were holding stones and saying she's worthless. She has no right to live. The law would say to condemn her, to, 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 to stone her to death. They are standing there with stones in their hand ready to destroy this woman. Come here, Emily, just for a moment. I want you to be the adulterous woman. I'm not prophesying. She, she is brought and thrown down at the feet of Jesus. She's stooped down, bracing for condemnation. She's taken to the house of God. She's in the temple. And it bothers me a little bit because he wasn't outside when this story happened. He was in the temple when this happened. And the Bible says when they, she was thrown at the feet of Jesus, that Jesus knelt down in the temple. He put his hands, are you ready, in the dirt. Why is there dirt in the temple? Why is there dirt in the temple? Because sometimes we can condemn everybody else when we've got sin in our own heart. And here they are standing with stones in their hand because she got caught. Not everybody got caught. And Jesus stoops down and writes, I don't know what he wrote. I'm not sure. There, I've heard a lot of opinions about that. But what I do know, he put his hands in dirt. He put his hands in some filth. He put his hands in something he'd later have to wash off. You know what it represented? He came down from a holy heaven down to a polluted earth. You know why? To take your pollution and make you holy. To take your dirt and make you clean. Oh, yes, he did. Yes, he did. And Jesus, I, I like this part. This is what I see. And she's, she's afraid to lift her. She's waiting on the stones. And all of a sudden, waiting on to be condemned. I've failed. I'm caught. You can only imagine her heart rate, the tears in her face. She knows the law. She knows what's about to happen. But Jesus stoops just, just small distance from her. And she hears his voice when they're saying, Master, what are we going to do to him? You know what the law says. They wanted everything in him to say, kill her. She's worthless. She's an adulteress. She's done this. They want it. But this is what he said. He that is without sin. Let him cast the first stone. Go ahead if you're perfect and kill her. Go ahead if you've never made a mistake. If you don't have any sin in your heart, you go ahead and throw the stone and kill her right here in my presence. But from the oldest to the youngest, all of a sudden in the room she heard, she heard the rock, she heard the rock fall. Another one fall and another one and another one. And, and 
finally Jesus, because I personally believe he would not even look them in the eye because Jesus is never looking at the accuser. His eyes are focused on the accused. He said, it's not those that are well that need a physician, but those that are sick. He said, it's not those that sin that need a savior, but those, it's not those that are righteous that need a savior, but those that have sinned. And when they walked away, condemned in their own heart, by their own heart, he says to the woman, he said, where are thine accusers? She looks up. She looks around. They're gone. Somewhere there's a little dust cloud here and a dust cloud there were the stones when they hit that dusty floor in the house of God. And he said, woman, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. He looks at her and says, give me your sin. I'll give you a second chance. What I've come to preach to you today is God is not, is not here today to tell you how bad you've been. He's here to make a divine exchange for what's wrong in your life. He's got something prepared for you. I said, he's got something better for you. Come on, can I get a witness from somebody that said, I got that better. I found he's got something better for me. So be seated just a moment. He, he steps in with the disciples. He's hanging out with 12 disciples. And one of those is by the name of Simon Peter, but he, he asked this question. You can see these divine exchanges that he's been making while he's walking on the earth and, and walking among them. I mean, he's saying, give me your lunchbox. The friend, the, the, the young boy that Andrew knows, and I, I, I feed 5,000. Just, just give, me, give me what's limited in your life. I'm going to give you what you can never get by yourself and nobody else can ever give you. Do you hear what I'm preaching to you today? And Simon Peter is standing there and the disciples and Jesus says, I've got a question for you all. In a, in a private conversation, it's just, it's just him with his disciples. He says, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? One of them raised their hands. It's like men in class. Yeah, yeah, John. Some say you're John the Baptist. Oh, another one said, oh, I've heard them call you Elijah. Somebody, matter of fact, people are saying you're one of the prophets. He said, no, 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 no. I've been walking with you. Who do you say that I am? People, a lot of people have a lot of opinions about God because they've never walked with him. They speculate what Christianity is. They talk about what it might be. People could come and say, I don't understand why people were jumping and leaping. I don't understand why there's, but you can't deny what you felt in this building today because there is something powerful here. It is God with us. No, no, no. He said, who do you say that I am? And, and, and Simon Peter said, I know. Thou art the Christ. You're the one Isaiah prophesied about. I know who you are. You're the one all the way back at Moses that Moses prophesied. You're the one that the psalmist David, King David, spoke of. You're the one. Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. You know what he was saying? You're Messiah. You're the master. You're the one that's been spoke of for, for thousands of years that would come to save us from our sin. And he said, oh, blessed art thou, Simon Bar. Simon, man, you didn't receive this from man, this revelation. You've received this from my father. That's what he told him. He said, let me tell you what I'm going to do, Simon, because you have a revelation of who I am. He said, up on this rock, I'm going to build my church. He said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He said, I'm going to have a people that hell can no longer influence or stop. We saw what happened in the garden, but it's not going to happen now. They're going to have more power. He said, as a matter of fact, Simon Peter, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. And whatsoever you bind on earth is going to be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And at this very moment, the Bible tells us that he stopped and he had a conversation with his disciples when he began to speak of this. When they said, thou art the Christ, we know who you are. Can I tell you, I'm not looking for another. I already found him. He's here. He's alive. Somebody shout, he's alive. He said, I'm going to give you the keys, Simon. And after this, he said, don't, don't, don't tell people who I am yet. The Bible says in verse 21 of Matthew 16, it says, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and, and suffer. He's going to suffer. He began to tell them, Simon, listen to me, John, James, I'm going to suffer. 
I'm going to suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and scribes. And as a matter of fact, they're going to kill me. He said, just, just remember, I will arise on the third day. But I'm going to suffer. Simon Peter stands up as he would. I always felt like he drank too much coffee. He was probably the ADD, ADHD disciple. Yeah, yeah. You're laughing because you are. Amen. That's you here today. You're like, yeah, you're, my, you're trying to get your mind back in here right now. My name's Aaron. I'm the pastor. I've been preaching for the last few minutes. He said, I've got something I want to say. Don't you dare. I know who you are. You're the master. I just told you you're the son of God. Don't you dare. Let him let, him let you suffer. Be it far. The Bible says he rebuked him. Don't you dare. Don't you dare let him kill you. I cannot imagine living without you. It's not fair. You're the only one I've ever known that's never had, had guile or sin in his heart. You're the only one I've ever met that never had a, a, a bad word to slip out, have a bad thought. I've walked with you these years. I've, I've watched you heal hands. I've watched you heal feet. I've watched you heal minds, people's families. And don't you dare let these people that, that have false religion condemn you and make you suffer. And he said, oh, Simon, be it far from you. Matter of fact, he rebuked him. He says, Satan, get behind me. He looked at Simon Peter. He said, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. He said, you're, you're, you're making a selfish decision. He said, you're thinking about yourself or what you don't understand before you can have what I've always intended for you to have. I have to make an exchange with you. I've never suffered. I've never had the pain that people have because of sin. My feet have never led me to a tree that I disobeyed God. My hands have never partaken of sin. My mind has never went to a place of he was tempted in all points but never did he ever sin how many know that's what the Bible says my hands have never my hands have never sinned my feet my mind and I've got to make an exchange I've got to suffer because I've got to make an exchange with some people so you know what I'm going to do instead of you dying for your sin I'm going to stand in your place here's what I'm going to do they're going to drive nails in my hands because Eve and Adam reached for the fruit. They're going to drive nails in my feet because their feet led them to a place they should have never been. They're going to put a crown of thorns on my head because their mind changed to become disobedient to what I intended for them to have. Matter of fact, they're going to pierce me in the side because that's where Eve was brought out of and later, later sin was in her life. I'm going to tell you that I have to suffer some things. You know why? So you won't have to suffer anymore. Oh yeah. Matter of fact, Simon, you're going to be offended at some things I'm telling you. He said, Lord, they might all be offended, but not me. Maybe John. Maybe Judas. Not me. I got you. Isn't that what we say nowadays? I'm with you. We're like this. He said, oh, Simon, there's things you don't understand about yourself. I've let you walk with me for the last three years, but there's some things in there you don't even realize that you have in your own heart. He said, you will deny me three times in the cock crow crow. <laughs> Not me. All of a sudden, after that last supper, Judas had walked out from the last supper and went and betrayed the Lord and came in and Somewhere around midnight with his disciples in the garden of Gethsemane, you can hear the footsteps coming and the soldiers with the torches and, and stick staves coming as if they're coming for a criminal. Well, yeah, they came to get him. Simon Peter grabbed his sword. You can't have him! You're not going to touch him. You're not going to touch him. And he swung with the sword to kill the Roman, Roman soldier. What he did, he, he missed and hit his ear and cut the ear to the ground. And Jesus said, Simon, stop it! Put up the sword! It's not how we fight. I told you I've got to go through some things. And reaches down and grabs the ear and puts it back on his head. And Could you imagine being that soldier? Could you imagine going home and tell your wife, i got a story for you tonight. What is it? Well, went and picked up Jesus and that hyper disciple that he has swung a sword at me, cut my ear off. And she goes. You don't look hurt to me. There's no blood. There's no evidence. Can I say when God fixes it, he doesn't leave any evidence it was ever broken. 
Give me the ear that led you away from my place. Give me that ear that led you away from my presence. I will heal you to where you will never have any residual that you were ever away from me. Simon, you've got to understand a few things. Isaiah prophesied and said he would be despised and rejected. He goes on and says he would be carried out with sorrow. Says he was afflicted, he was wounded, he was bruised. Jesus, he was whipped, he was oppressed, he was in prison. Matter of fact, he was judged. He goes on and said he made his grave with the wicked. He was made to grieve. He poured out his soul to death. He bare the sin of many. Ladies and gentlemen, 2 Corinthians says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So here they came. They drag him away. Drag him away. You know what they did? They imprisoned him. You know why? So he can get you out of your prison. They judged him because that's what people do when you make a mistake. Oh, yes. They, they tied him to a whipping post and beat him with 39 stripes. 39 stripes, they whipped him with a whipping post until you could look into his body and see. He didn't make one mistake. He didn't create one sin. Yet the wrath of some Roman centurion led by an angry crowd crying, crucify him, rejecting him and saying, just kill him. Here he is being whipped. People have run from him and fled from him. The only disciple that remained was was. Because John was somewhere. Peter's denying him and grieving because he's failed the Lord. But I tell you today, he was suffering. The Calvary was suffering. He would drop to his knees and gather back up. You know why? Because there's one more disease he's going to heal. There's one more situation he's going to fix. He didn't take it light. He didn't do anything less than, nevertheless, not my will but thine be done. They bring him from there and hand him a cross and take him up to Golgotha's hill, what we know as Calvary. They laid him down on a cross and here it was. For Eve's sin in her hand drives a nail in his hand. And for Adam's sin with his hand drives a nail in his hand. For those feet that led them away from the, from the things of God, a nail went through both feet. And here it is in him who's never failed, who's never made a mistake. They put a crown of thorns upon him. You know why? He's taken the curse that's been in your mind. All those emotional issues and all all those thoughts you cannot control. He's taking it upon himself and hanging on a cross. And the mouth that had never sinned, that had never had dirt to come out of it or bad food to go in it, he cried, I thirst. And he did. They come up and they put vinegar. They put gall in his mouth. You know why? Because the, the, the fruit that had come into that mouth of Adam and Eve that has trickled all the way down, that we put stuff in our body we shouldn't put in our body. And it, it creates sin and sickness and pain. And so, oh, I'm preaching to you today because there's people under the sound of my voice. You said, I wish that I never put that in me. I wish I'd have never started that habit. I wish I'd have never, I ne wish it had never entered my eyes and my ears. Could I tell you, right before it died, he cries, one more time, he lifted his body. He said, Father, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. And he gave it the ghost, and when he died, pfft, he had conquered the result of sin. You know what it was? It was death. It was death. That's what he said in the garden. If you take of the tree, you're going to die. Check out this tree. It's going to lead to death. It's, it's just a matter of time. It's going to bring death to your life. It'll bring death to your mind. It'll bring death to your relationship. It'll bring death to what you used to love. Sin will always bring death. The wages of sin is death. And Joseph of Arimathea with a couple people come and grab him off the cross and wrap his body up and put him in a borrowed tomb. Look at your neighbor and say, he's not going to stay there. They put this, and on the third day he got up. And he made this proclamation. He told them when they realized that he's alive, he told those ladies, he said, you go tell my disciples and Peter that I've risen. Somebody shout, he's up. Amen. He's risen. He's not dead this morning. He's alive. It's, it's one of the most famous verses of all time. It's John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have what? Everlasting life. Could I say to you, for he came not into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be. Look at your neighbor and say, neither do I condemn you. 
I come to tell somebody I don't care how far you've been, how long you've been gone, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. You can make a divine exchange on this Sunday morning. Give him everything wrong in your life. He'll give you everything prepared for you. After Simon Peter's rebuke, as I come to a close this morning, after Simon Peter's rebuke in Matthew 16, when he said, Lord, you can't suffer, put it far from you. He looked at Simon Peter and said, I've got to talk to you all about something else. Not only do I have to suffer, you've got to realize something for you. He says it this way, then Jesus, then said Jesus unto his disciples. Somebody say, speak to me, Jesus. I may want to hear from the Lord. He said, if any man will come after me. Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake, he said, shall find it. He said, I'm asking for something else for you. I'm not just asking to heal your hand. I'm not just asking to heal your feet. I'm not just asking to heal your mind and your emotions. He said, there's something else I want to talk to you about. He said, I've got a place on the other side of this life. I still believe it. It's streets of gold. It's gates of pearl. It's walls of jasper. When I was going, growing up in church, there was a man that used to sing a song, I'm going to a city 1,500 miles long. It's coming down from heaven. There's room for everyone. He'd sing it over and over and over again. It seemed like the song was 1,500 miles long. But there's a heaven. John, when he peeked his head up in eternity and looked around, you know what he said? I see a place where there's no more pain. There's no more sorrow. There's no more suffering. There's no more partying or dying over here. Can I tell you? He's got a place prepared for you and me. That's better than just a better life. He said, I want to give you eternal life. I submit to you today, there's more to it than believing in him. Will you follow him? Simon Peter tried to deny his, his relationship with Jesus and they said, oh no, you were with him. You were with him, not you believed in him. Because you can believe in him and not walk with him. You can believe in him and disobey him and go a different direction. You can prove that with Simon Peter. Did I tell you? That's why Isaiah, in the midst of all of those things about him suffering, this is what he simply said. He said, all we like sheep have gone astray. There's not a person in this building that's born perfect, lived perfect, even has he been born again, been perfect. But neither do I condemn thee. I say it again today, neither do I condemn thee. Because one of these days when you take your last breath, where are you going to go? Is it going to be a place prepared for him, for you, with him? I go to prepare a place for you. I want you to look at your neighbor and say, he's got to prepare a place for you. He said, hear me. As I close on this point, I tell you, I fell into prayer. You've got you to do more than believe. You've got to follow him. Walk with him. He that believeth in me as the scripture hath said. And he says in Matthew chapter 16 verse 26. Look what he says. Matthew chapter 16 verse 26. For what man, for what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Probably one of the scariest portions of scripture I've ever heard in my whole life. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? At some point in your life, the Lord's going to walk up to you and say, neither do I condemn thee, but I've got something I want to give you. Give me your brokenness and I'll heal you. Give me your sorrow, I'll give you joy. Give me your sickness and I'll give you healing. I've watched blinded eyes open five feet from me. I, I've, watched, I've watched people that had legs shorter than the other grow right before me. I've seen it happen. I've seen cancers disappear, tumors disappear. I've seen canceled surgeries because when God walks in, he says, come here. I've got, just, just give it to me. Watch what I've got for you with nail-scarred hands. I've already taken care of it. I'm telling somebody, it's already done. But he has to have a, come let us reason, just give it to me. Give me your sin, give me your... Hallelujah. My kids love this picture.
as some of their favorite thinking about God. You see that little teddy bear in her hand? And Jesus said, I've got something better. But I can't give you what I have for you until you trust me. You can trust the doctor, but can you trust the Savior? You can trust your family, but can you trust the Savior? I'm telling you, the Lord has walked into this building. I feel his angel in this room right now. What's, what's hurting you and keeping you? The last verse I give you today is from the book of Mark. Excuse me, Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28. Let's look and see what it says. Matthew 11 and 28. Hear what he says. Come unto me. All you that labor and are heavy laden. What did he say? I'll give you rest. He said, take my yoke upon you. You know what that is? You ever see two cows yoked together, big wooden yoke? He wasn't saying, I'm going to put you in bondage. What he was saying is, I want you to walk with me. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I, I, don't, I don't want you to just believe in me. I want to teach you. I want, I want to walk with you through life. Let me be the love in your marriage, the love in your parenting. Let me show you the way that I've had planned for you. You try to do without me, but it's going to end up empty. And you're not going to fulfill the purpose I've had for you. He said, come unto me, that labor in our... Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Labor in heaven, laid I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly at heart. I promise you, if you'll come, you're going to find rest. Can't sleep at night? Come. You'll have peace in your thoughts. Afraid to be alone? Afraid of tomorrow? Jesus is saying, I, neither do I condemn you. Come. Give me everything wrong in your life. I've got something better prepared for you. Can somebody say amen? Let's bow our heads. Lord, we love you today and thank you for this Easter. You are here in this room. I have felt you for days praying about this specific sermon. Amazing people have gathered from different cities even that are here today. And they've even wondered if you ever hear them or see them because they felt like their sin, like Simon Peter, would forever separate them from you. But I hear today, you saying, come unto me. Ye who are weary, come. Ye who are thirst, come. And whosoever will, let them take of the water of life freely. But I tell you, God is reaching for each and every one of you. Easter's in vain in your life. If you just believe, but you don't follow. He said, deny your way and let me show you a better way. God, you're going to miss out if you don't receive what he has for you. You're simply a prayer away. You're a God moment away. You're, you're I need you, Jesus, away. God, there's something better for me than pills. There's something better for me than a bar. There's something better for me than addiction and fear and loneliness and agony and insomnia. God, something better for me than guilt and sorrow. I come to tell you, he took it all upon himself. He was made sin so you could come out of where you are. Let's bow our heads and begin to pray. Lord Jesus, we need you today. <laughs> Hallelujah. They're going to sing and God's going to move upon your heart as he already is. I promise you, you don't have to pray fancy. You just need to begin to tell the Lord, here I am. Here I am. God, I need you. I'm asking you to forgive me. That hot tear in your eye, that's God touching your heart. He's not done with you yet. He's not finished with your life. He's got something prepared. Go ahead and begin to sing today. Let's just sit at our seat before for a moment. Let's begin to pray all over this room. Please nobody leave at this moment. God is moving in this room right now. Let's begin to talk to the Lord all over this building. I can face you in the name of the Lord.
today and you say, I'd like to make a divine exchange. I believe that God has something prepared for me. I want you to step out of your seat and come to the altar today and say, today, don't wait on anybody else. We're going to pray with you. No one's going to be embarrassed. No one's going to embarrass you. I'm telling you what I feel and pray for. Today, you can make a divine exchange and come up here and talk to the Lord and say, today, I'm changing some ways in my life. God's going to fix it. He's doing it. There's no pressure. We're just so glad you're here. But today is a turning point for somebody. This is day one for my life. Because. 